dedicated to geeks and nerds. You're listening to Project I Radio, 24-7 Nerdgasm. It's on. Bazaar. 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 Yo, we're listening to Bazong, the bizarre and weird fiction podcast. I am your host, Mr. Frank. Now, before we get into anything tonight, I'm sure there are a couple of you out there that are saying, what's going on, Mr. Frank? You're from the Books, Beer, and Bullshit podcast. What's this business about Bazong? Well, fear not. Books, Beer, and Bullshit has gone nowhere. But this is an opportunity for me to step away from Books, Beer, and Bullshit and record a little more podcasting and get to talk more intensively with the folks I want to talk to that I can't normally do on the Books, Beer, and Bullshit podcast. So this is like my solo project. And as anybody who listens to the Books, Beer, and Bullshit podcast knows, I am a big fan of bizarro fiction, something I don't always get to cover on the podcast. But we can talk about it all the time here on Bizarre, and that's what we're going to do. I intend to talk to... Anybody who's anyone in the bizarre and weird fiction genre. And we're going to kick off this podcast with none other than Mr. Danger Slater. In my opinion, one of the most important voices in Bizarro today. And as it would happen, Danger Slater has just come out with a new book. It's entitled I Will Rot Without You. And it is one of the most amazing books I've read. Not only this year, but ever. It's going to be a book that everybody who is into Bizarro is going to need to read. I Will Rot Without You is nothing short of brilliant. So, I had the opportunity to not only interview Danger Slater for the inaugural episode of Bizong, but as it would work out, Mr. Danger Slater was in town in New Jersey where we record this podcast. Danger Slater's from New Jersey. He's living in Portland now. But he's back visiting his hometown. He decided to grace us with his, grace me with his presence. So we were able to sit down face to face and have a discussion about Danger Slater's new book, about his new publisher, Fungasm Press. And we were also able to talk about writing and Danger's approach to writing and uh, where his mindset was while he was writing the book and where he's going and all that kind of fun stuff. The stuff I want to ask Danger Slater, not only as a reader, but as a writer myself. Now, Danger Slater, if you don't know him, is the most flammable author in the world. He loves to use exclamation points, and he demands that you love him. So open your ears and open your hearts to Mr. Danger Slater on the Bazong Podcast. So I'd like to welcome to Bazong podcast the inaugural bazong podcast bazong bazong <laughs> hey i can't be all gems right <laughs> so i like to <laughs> i'm honored to have mr danger slater on the inaugural bazong podcast and not only to have him on but to have him sitting directly across from me face to face for this interview yeah thanks man it's actually uh pretty great here at, uh in your basement in your new house here Yes, this is this is all kinds of inaugural tonight. We got uh, a new podcast and a new house and a new basement at my new bar. So this is a total hang. And uh, I could think of nobody better than you, sir, to have on this inaugural podcast because I think you are about to blow up, sir. Right? If you don't, I'm about you to should. explode. You are about to explode. You are the most flammable. Yeah, the most, it's flammable. I'm very flammable. Okay. The, mo- the world's most flammable author. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's a good thing we have you down here by all this alcohol. <laughs> your star will shine. So I want to start out by touching on your book. I will rot without you. Sure. When's it coming out? Uh, well, it's coming out February eighth. February eighth. Now we record this ahead of February eighth. Yeah. So there's a chance this will come out just after that. Okay. But we're probably right around the release date for I Will Rot Without You. So it came out last week, February 8th. Right. Yeah, there we go. You, so, can, edit, you can edit around that, right? Oh, we sure can. 
So in I Will Rot Without You, it's uh, under your new publisher, or you're working with a new publisher, Fungasm Press. Right. Can you tell us a bit about them? Uh, well, Fungasm Press is an imprint of Eraserhead Press. Um, it's John Skip's boutique imprint. Um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with John Skip, uh, horror writer. Um, he is a name. He is a name. Um, so basically it's, he kind of heads it up and kind of curates all the authors. Um, it's a lot of bizarro, um, but more focused on more genre bending aspects of bizarro, not like a straight, you know, horror kind of bizarro, like things with aspects of, of comedy or bizarre or, uh, or horror or science fiction or, you know, this and that. That is sort of what I took away from, like, you know, Eraserhead is, is, tends to be that, that pure, straight bizarre that you think right. of. And you have Deadite, which focuses on, more on the cult, the horror side. Mm-hmm. And what I'm seeing from Fungasm is, like you said, there's a sort of a satirical, humorous, a genre bending take on bizarro. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, there's four, okay, so there's four books coming out at this, there's three other books in addition to mine coming out at the same time. Right. Um, I haven't read all of them. I've, I've, I've read, um, one of them I've read, Long Form Religious Porn by, um, Laura Lee Barr. Right. And I've kind of peeked at the other two, which is one from Autumn Christian and one from Deborah Gr- uh, Gray. And all these books are very different from each other. So it doesn't really seem that there's like this unifying, uh, aspect yeah. to, to what is coming out. Um, in so much as it's stuff that, has tickled John Skip's fancy and he's kind of, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't even know. I don't even know. <laughs> I lost it. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. You know, you know how that goes. All right. So now what, what is, is this a, a sort of relaunching because there's also some books that they have in Fungasm that have been out previously. Violet Lavoie's Genghis, uh, come. Yeah. 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 That's a great book. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is, it is kind of a relaunching. He, um, from what Skip had told uh, us, he wants to do more of a, um, you know, um, publishing on a schedule. You know, he, we're gonna, he says he's intending to, to come out with books twice a year. Um, I think it was in December, and this is for the future, uh, December and June, I think, or July. So it's going to be a twice a year publishing schedule. Right. So it's going to be more of a regular thing. Before, it was just a lot of um, the books would just come out. You know, when, as, as, as he, he as he got them, or, yeah. or something he wanted to put out would come across his, uh, you know, his uh-huh. desk. So this is a more serious focus on on, on the publisher. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And he also ran uh, in uh, was it Indiegogo yeah, campaign? Indiegogo, yeah, Indiegogo. Uh, very successful. Yeah, that, that was surprisingly successful. I knew, I didn't know, but I, you know, I was putting a lot of effort into helping this thing be successful. We were, we were only going for, um, I think it was 2500 Yeah. Um, and that was basically just to cover the costs of, you know, the covers and putting the books together. And, and uh, you know, we're just trying to break even. And we ended up doing uh, another 1000 extra. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was a lot of, uh, I think we had like 89, no, no, like 90, 98 backers. So yeah, it was, yeah, was great. I was, I was one of those backers, yeah. so I've had an opportunity to already get my hands on I Will Rot You. And I'm glad I did, and I'm glad I was able to to preview this book and talk about it, because um, right away, my initial reaction, I, I had a reaction as soon as I opened the book, the first line. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tickle your balls, <laughs> so take them out. I'm going to polish them up. Let, me lay, let me lay them on this bar. There you go. It's not often I read a book, and the first line strikes me as like holy shit you know there's those classic yeah. it was the best of times i'm talking it hit me like that it the best of times worst of time type of opening line here is the opening line for i will rot without you cockroaches fill up my life like raindrops in a reservoir i mean holy shit let me tell you on that one sentence on, on what is that 10 words yeah. I, I knew immediately where this book was going. I mean, it just incredible, dude. And, and <laughs> um, 
not only that, not only did you set a tone so amazingly with one line and the opening line, but you have really outdid yourself on every line. Um, I really get the sense that you really kind of focused almost in every sentence. Is, is that kind of how this was written? E- well, yeah. I'm a, I'm a really, really big rewriter. Like, I will sit there and rewrite sentences over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until I get that word combination that strikes as, you know, this is what I'm trying to convey. And it's funny that you talk about that first line because that didn't come to me until almost like the second or third draft of the book. Wow. You know, like, the, okay, the first chapter is like, it's called The Roach Problem. Right. My original first line was just the roach problems getting worse. Okay. You know, and I was like sitting there and I'm like, eh, that's good. You know, it conveys. It does work. You know, that's why I made it the chapter right. name. But I was like, how do I say this? Like how. More artistic. Yeah. Not even that. Like you, you want to. It's really important to, I think, you know, um, that first chapter especially is like setting up the entire tone of the book uh uh-huh. you know you gotta grab them right away i know when i go to a bookstore or i'm going to even on amazon you know you preview a book you're yeah. going is this something that i want to buy i sit there i'll read the first page right you know you right. can read the back cover and i go oh that sounds cool let me see if this person can write and i'll sit there and read that first page so i spent a lot of time on that first chapter uh uh-huh. setting up that tone getting that you know is that those words arranged just to kind of paint that picture. And then, you know, it was going through and focusing, like you said, on every single line. Right. Now, do you, do you really like blow through your first draft, just write the words, get them on the page and then go back and craft? Or are you really kind of metering that intensely as you go? Uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't do a, a quick first draft. I do a really, I basically I'll, what I do is I sit down, I kind of do like a first drafty, you know, like a quick version of it, um, of a chapter or maybe half a pa- chapter, a page, whatever is coming to me. Okay. The next day when I sit down the right again, I go back and I revise what I did the day before leading, you know, and then I'll make that as good as it you know, I can make it for that day. Okay. Then go into the next part, kind of do that okay. next part, like kind of first drafty. So yeah. I'm kind of redraft, like I'm kind of revising as I go. Right. So uh, that's like almost one of those things, as we know, any kind of rule in writing is meant right. to be broken, but like one of those things you always hear is don't, don't edit as you write. But you, that is something you do. You kind of get, get it. Uh, well, I think, I think if you edit, well, I mean, I guess it is editing. I mean, to me, it's, it's it feels, I was going to say more like polishing. I guess those are synonyms. Uh-huh. But, like, it doesn't really feel like I'm editing. I'm not really judging what I've written. Uh-huh. I'm just going, how can I make this as pretty as I can make this? Okay. How can I convey these ideas as good as I can convey them? Uh-huh. You know? And um, when I go through, I feel like it kind of sets my mind. If I go through what I did the day before, the next day, it kind of gets me back in that frame of mind to continue on. Uh-huh. So it's kind of like, um, you know, priming myself. Like getting yourself in a mindset. In a mindset to, to continue to the story like on, yeah. Uh-huh. And then as you as I go, it just gets easier because I've kind of set that tone, you know, from the beginning. I like that. And, and kind of polished it. And then, you know, by the time I'm like two thir- halfway two-thirds through a book, that last part like yeah. the last part of this book yeah i i wrote like in like a month as wow. opposed to the first two thirds which took me seven months. months you know yeah so it just like you kind of use that rewriting or i use the rewriting to kind of build up steam to get you and yeah. to get you back into the story yeah, yeah. yeah and to get you in that frame of mind of uh, being artistic with your words yeah or or just like especially like creative descriptive there's there's like a lot of like there's a lot going on in, in, in this book, especially like um, trying to get into that character's frame of mind too, you know, in, in the place where that character would be. It really helps to like 
have to re force like to force yourself to go through it again right and you know rewrite it again and then you're like by the time you you've get to the point where you have to make up new words you've you've kind of like hypnotized yourself or fallen back into that trance of like this is what the character is doing and then the story just kind of flows out you out know actually yeah that. like you know where you want to go but like it's like i don't know the path i don't know the road i'm taking right you know so based on what we're talking about like i was going to ask you um how much do you outline your story how much do you you know pre-think out your story or are you really just kind of letting the story tell itself as you write it uh, uh you know it's it's super weird man every 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 story and every book kind of like demands to be to be told a little bit differently um for this one in particular i had maybe like a two page outline i didn't really have like this happens and this happens and this then this then this but i was like this is something that needs to happen like sequentially like in chapter one i need to talk about these cockroaches in this house by chapter three or four i need to talk about you know the city you know paint you know a, a bigger setting of where he is by right. chapter five i need to introduce this character by chapter nine I, this needs to happen you know so it's like you're kind of setting these little mile markers up uh -huh. to head to you know right and as you go there's there's an organic thing that kind of happens where maybe story takes a yeah, little different yeah yeah maybe maybe what i thought i was heading towards I, I wasn't, and I you kind of need to veer off and let the story kind of you know tell itself at that point. Right. So to go back on my point of 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 really how in awe I was of how carefully you craft every sentence, and it reminds me of um, more so this book struck me more so than all your other work. All your other work I've thought extremely highly of. But I, I definitely noticed an, uh, a heavy uptick in how detailed you were, sentence by sentence. You, it, it comes across that you were really paying attention line by line. Uh, and I'm, I was sitting there reading it, knowing I'm going to interview about this. I was highlighting lines that struck me. I'm like, I, I could, I could highlight everything, and that's that's where I saw like, man, he's he's just on the ball with this. So, um. Where does this story come from, um, from, for, from you personally? This, this, there feels like you didn't just make this all up. Like this came from somewhere. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of, okay. <laughs> there, there is, I'm going to say pretty much everything I write, there's, it's probably 60% true. Okay. All right. At least emotionally true. Right. Like, I mean, the things that are happening are fantastical or, or ridiculous or, you know, in, in the case of this book, like horrifying, yes. you know, but like the emotional, uh, the crux that this character is experiencing, I'm, I'm trying to base off things. Um, it's about, I mean, essentially the book is about uh, a guy who lives by himself he is upset because his girlfriend that he lived with has moved out and these cockroaches that infest his apartment because he lives in this crappy apartment are taking mold out of his bathroom and feeding it to him which is causing his body to fall apart fucking brilliant <laughs> and then there's there's like there's a couple little um you know side characters and other things going on and then there's a, a another neighbor girl who, who he um is somewhat fond of right you know and, um, I mean, I went through a breakup about a year and a half before I started this book, which was a big breakup for me. It was a, it was a tough one. Okay. And I did live in a crappy apartment. It did not have cockroaches. <laughs> but weirdly enough, that whole thing about the cockroaches, yeah. I had thought of years ago. And I never did anything with it. I was just like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there was this story about a guy in cockroaches and like they weren't like talking cockroaches or anything like in Joe's apartment. And, right. Like, it wasn't like goofy or anything. It was just like about this guy and these cockroaches and like I didn't really know what to do with it. And uh -huh. that idea sat in the back of my head for years until I, I you know, I went through this breakup and you know, and I started talking to another girl. So uh -huh. there was, you know, I was kind of processing 
actually having to let this person that I broke up with go uh-huh. to accept another person into my life. Right. And then it's some, for some reason, it kind of clicked with that old idea about this guy with these cockroaches, and I just kind of rolled it all together in my head. And uh-huh. It's amazing. It, I mean, it is basically the story of me getting over an ex, uh-huh. you know, yeah. in, a, in a way. Uh-huh. Did that work as a, a, a catharsis for you, or had you... Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it is. It, there's, a, there's like an emotional purging, you know, that you have to go through to, to kind of connect with the character. Again, though, like I said, when you're rereading and trying to get back into that mindset of the character, it's tough because you have to, like, be in that moment still. Like, mm-hmm. you have to keep, in a way, suffering. Right. Not like I'm sitting there like, a, you know, a weepy... Right. Mess or anything, but, but you, you have, have to, to keep, merge your you, brain into that you have at that to, point in time. Yes, you have to keep going back to this wound or this thing that right. is bothersome or, or, or uh, not bothersome, but you know, that hurts you. Yeah. And you have to keep going back to it in order to like, I mean, in a, in a way, stitch it up. Uh huh. You know? And I thought, I thought about that as I was writing this too, like, um, you know, where, where in this, history you are personally as opposed to the character because obviously knowing where you are in your relationship now it's like sometimes you know you are relating this emotional tale that you maybe have already put behind you and you are in a better frame of mind now and then having to write it and sort of revisit it like obviously you hadn't lost something yeah. about that but what i did notice and if I do have a critique right. uh, about anything, about one little point, was I didn't quite feel the character's connection to his ex was as strong as you wanted me to feel it. Does that make sense? Like his pining for his ex and, and how much, like when she shows up, that it irritates him and, and, and gets to him and, right. and, and kind of sets him back. I knew what you are going for. If I think something got lost a little bit there, I think it was that. And I had, I had been wondering to myself, like, was, was Danger already too happy? Already past this girl writing this? When, when, uh, he was trying to convey those points. Well, it, it, the thing is, like, when you break up with someone that you've been out, going out with for a really long time, you know, or, you know, maybe married to, or whatever the case may be, like, the range of emotions is not really a uh, a very like clear it's not like i'm just going to be upset like there's i'm happy because there's obviously a rift in this relationship right, right. and now i'm free of it but there's also i'm upset because what went wrong i did love this person and then there's a little bit of anger like what the fuck you know, fuck them or whatever the case yeah, may be, yeah. you know? And then there's like this self-loathing aspect to it. And it's like trying to get that all together. You know, maybe I thought was missing. Thinking about it more now. Maybe, maybe there was, uh, some history for the reader right. missing. Maybe a, a, a chapter, a couple of uh, paragraphs to sort of go back in the past and, and, and see the, the better part of, of this. Right. Character's relationship with his ex when it was good to feel that connection. Like I said, if I had a critique about it, like that would be the one thing I didn't quite think came across as, as crisp as it, it could have. Yeah, I, I totally, actually, you know, now that you mentioned it, I'm like, well, fuck, man. You know, I, I still got three weeks before this book comes out. Can I, uh, can I go back in there? But, um, I mean, I, I honestly, like, the, the the story picks up six months after the the the, the guy and the girl broke right, up. Right. Yeah. So it's not like we're we're witnessing the demise of something. I mean, we are. Yeah. In there, but there's also like, you know, this maybe budget uh, blossoming relationship with this other girl too right. at the same time. Um, and you're right, man. The only the only thing I do I did mention when I was talking about their past is when she leaves the ex girlfriend for the first time, and he's like. Looking around the apartment, like, oh, we bought these salt shakers yeah, together, yeah, and we yeah, bought yeah. this together, and we did this together, and that's like really, you're right, man. That, that really, yeah, yeah that's, that's the only, that's the only kind of backstory you get. Don't change a thing. No, no, I love <laughs> <laughs> don't go back and, re- and rewrite that. But that, you know, 
I like to be fair and, and, you know, if I do see something, you know, to point it out. Sure. But that, that's my reaction to it. Now, we'll go back to polishing your balls because uh, I, I left them up on the bar for you. So. I know. They're right there. I'm just, I'm rub, rubbing them act absentmindedly <laughs> at the moment. There was a line that struck me. I don't, I, you use a lot of nice words that I had to, I had to go refer to the dictionary a few times more than I have in the past. <laughs> yeah. You had this line. It was so wonderful. Uh, let's see where I could pick off. The line itself is, they lay on dehensent shores of my mind. Uh, I'm going to try to think of what you're talking about here. I, I think you're talking about, like, memories of the X. And you, you write this line, they lay on dehensent shores of my mind. What the fuck is dehensent? So I look it up. It's a botany term. It's a scientific botany term of, like, the point where, like, a fruit splits open. Like, that weak point on the skin of a fruit. Yeah. And, and I'm like, holy fuck, you just use, like, a scientific word in the most beautiful, poetic way. Like, where do you pick up? Did you have the word dehensent somewhere in your mind? Like, do you go looking for that? How do you come up with something like that? Um, well, it... it <laughs> <laughs> A lot, I mean, okay. When I, when I first started writing, I, I, you know, I was like 18, 19 years old and I knew this is something I wanted to do. So I was like, I need to focus on building a vocabulary. So I spent a lot of time highlighting words I didn't know in books that I was reading, looking them up and then using them in my own writing or using them in sentences. And then I would buy vocabulary builder books and sit around, you know, 20 years old. Like, yeah you know, doing like spelling, like I'm in like class or something, you know, like, but I was, you know, I wasn't in school or anything. I'm just sitting there doing like vocabulary books in my bedroom by myself. Just yeah. I wanted to, you know, to have all these words to go to. So sometimes when you're just, or when I'm, when I'm just sitting there, like just, it just pops into my mind. Like this is the word, this is, you know, there's, it's the right amount of syllables. It's the right, you know, amount of flair. And it's saying it's the right what idea. I need to say, you know? Yeah. And, and like you're saying, like uh, like a, a botany term, there's there's a lot of like mold in the book, a lot of like yeah. mushrooms, and you know, part of rot is you know fungus and stuff. Right, so, right. I mean, it just seemed to uh, to work. That makes. I mean, it just makes a ton of sense. I was sort of the same way in, in my younger years, trying to find the better word, trying to find the the word that nobody else would find. To, to talk about a situation. I was pretty handy with it. I wouldn't say I was excelled at it and I surely didn't study it. I just sort of had a knack for just holding on to those, those good words. Those yeah. Yeah. $50 words. Well, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm like some like endless genius or something. Like, I mean, I'll use a thesaurus too sometimes. You oh, know? sure. But it's not to find a fancy word. It's to find, the, the right word. word. You yeah. know, it's the word that conveys exactly what I want to say. Yeah. You know, I always use this example um, when talking about words in particular, but like, if you are, are going to say you hate somebody. Right. And you're writing it, there's a, th there's so many different ways to say you hate somebody. Yep. And they all mean subtly different things. And they all like. It's degrees. Yeah. There's, and... you hate someone, you abhor them, you loathe them. You know, like there's, there's, there's so many ways to just like say mm -hmm. something simple, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and it's like finding that right word. And, you know, it just seems it just, you know, that word was the right word to use at the time. I just it was put it in there. The most right word. There can be no <laughs> other more correct word than dehensin. Okay. <laughs> so moving on to some other ideas. Oh, this is just something like I totally connected with an idea a moment and and this is how it goes it plays out um yeah okay i reply i follow her down the hall leaving behind the ticker tape parade of unpaid bills defaulted bank statements and past due notices still raining down from my mailbox like i just returned home from world war ii i've been in that situation you know <laughs> where there's it's like the relationship has gone so bad and Everything falls apart from it, and everything uh, compounds on it. All those, the bills pile up, yeah. all those responsibilities, are, everything is getting let go. And, and 
you, you have this sea of shit behind you, and it's it's a big giant metaphor, and it's a big real tangible thing that I I, I connected with, and it's one of those ideas that like I knew this was coming from somewhere <laughs> that happened, you know, yeah, and like but even that thing you're referring to, right? Like so, as the book's going is going on, the the bills in his mailbox just keep getting you know, more and more and they keep piling up to the point where they're just literally pouring out of his mailbox constantly and they're weighing so much that they're bowing the floor of the apartment. You know, you're taking this to like this absurd degree. But yeah, it is coming from a place where, you know, you I lived with somebody and then they leave and I'm in this apartment and I can't afford it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. you know, and everything that we were building is still there and I'm by myself with it, you know, and I'm just yeah. like, I have you handle this and it feels like life. it's bigger than you yeah, and taking changes. over you. And it's like burying you. And I mean, I didn't, even when I started writing that about the bills, I didn't even know that that's what I was going to be getting at. until right. I kept doing it, you know? And I was like, yeah. Oh yeah, this is what I was saying. You know? Yeah. I have highlighted here. September 18th, 1974. Is that date significant? No, I don't know. Wait, why did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> I figured, um, was it was it the X Files where ever you saw like a time or yeah. any kind of numerical? No, thing I don't know. Always... Wait, I, I don't even remember what that's a reference <laughs> to. Oh, what was happening here? Stop repeating me. How dare you do that? Canary, what the fuck? How could you possibly know I was going to... Oh, this is one of his uh, doppelganger shows. Yeah, yeah, okay. And they're just repeating. Just repeating He's saying that. the most random thing. Yes. So no, yeah. That, that happened to be the most that random That was random, thing. yeah. I, was, I just picked a date. I don't know. <laughs> I thought for sure you had like an X-Files Chris Carter type of thing going on. <laughs> Maybe I could, maybe in like my future works, I could build, start building this like yeah, shared like universe make up around some, it. Yeah, you know? make up some awesome story about what the fuck that was. All right, so the, those are the, yeah, man, those are the things I sort of. It's another henna, henna brown eyes. Like, who says henna brown eyes? That's like a perfect description of, yeah. of a shade of brown yeah, eyes. Yeah. Henna, henna, henna brown. <laughs> it's just struck me. Those are the types of things that struck me, and and I, I just wanted to. To highlight. So, um, upon completing reading this story, like I said, I was just I was just blown away. Everything was carefully measured, metered, crafted, described, and I, I got to the end of the book and I close it, and I said to myself, "It is January third, whatever day it was, very early in January." So I just read the Wonderland Book of the Year winner. And, I, you know, that's me. That's me. That's my opinion. Yeah, I don't want to. That'd be awesome. Yeah. It's a bold statement, <laughs> given it, given what it is. But it's a bold statement. But that's that's what I'm left with. I can't imagine anything coming out this year is, is going to be that good. I think you really put an incredibly solid effort in with this book. And uh, that's that's just how I feel. I, I, I can't imagine anything's going to hold up that for at least the rest of this year. And it's strong enough. It's going to take me a while for me to feel like anything was that well written. That's, uh, how do you, how, but how do you, how do you, <laughs> you know what to say? That? That's a I know, one, I, I'm, I'm heaping praise and it's, <laughs> it's, it's rough to respond to that. But like my question would be, how did you feel about the book yourself when you finished it, when you got to the last line? Uh, I mean, I, it, it's, it's weird because there's no like, when you're, when you're going through the process of writing, it's not like there's a, a like a, a hard period at the end of at the sentence. You know, there's no clear, I'm done moment. It's, it kind of like trickles. Okay. It's not like I like wrote that last line, threw my hands up in the air and was just like, yeah, yeah, I'm done. I fucking uh, did it. You know, like, you know, I get there and I, and I'm sitting there and I look at it and then, you know, I'm like, well, let me put it away for a minute. Let me come back to it. Let me let, you know, my girlfriend read it. Let me get some feedback from her. And she went through it with a red pen and, and really, you know, tore it up. Yeah. She, she, uh, was a huge help in this whole process, you know? And, um, yeah. So there was no like really 
revolution. Final moment. Yeah, you know. Well, I mean, I know, I know. You, you know, right at the end and go, the book's done. There's yeah. still a whole lot of, of, of more work to be done. But even even writing that last line, you weren't sure the the story ended there. You really I'm, had a lot. Oh, uh, it's okay, you know, it's funny. You should even bring this up because. Um, John Skip was my editor too, and the original draft I sent him, there was one more chapter. Okay. That isn't in the book. Okay. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to think how to say this. Uh, essentially, it was paying off uh, a couple things I had set up earlier that don't end up getting paid off in the book. Okay. Um, not big things though, but, it, um. You were tidying up? Yeah, it's tidying up a little bit more. It was, it was more like an epilogue. Okay. Than a last chapter, you know? Um, and his big thing was, and this is, this is, this is, this is a testament to him, uh, as an editor, because he didn't really give me, I mean, he was just like, this is great. I like it. I like everything about it. He goes, the last chapter. And he, he doesn't say, you know, do this, do this, do this. He goes, it's written great. I like it, but why is it there? Okay. And that was it. He goes, why is it there? And I'm like, you know, I'm sitting to, I'm talking to him on, uh, on, on like Messenger on Facebook. And I'm like, well, you know, I wanted to do this and blah, blah, blah. And then I, I realized I was like making excuses of why I did it. Like, and I'm like, I, st- I stopped myself in the middle of it and I'm like, I'm not in school. I'm not being reprimanded. I don't have to come up with an excuse. Let me sit there and think about what he just asked me and then get back to him. So I was like, I'm going to, sit on this for a day. Uh-huh. I'm going to talk to you tomorrow. Uh-huh. So I did, and I sat on it, and I come back, and I'm like, I don't know if that does need to be there. And he's like, I think the strongest ending you could have had was the ending of the chapter before the right. original last chapter. He's like, everything you need to say is said at that point. Right there, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, I think that's the ending. It's kind of nice that he let you chew on that, though. Yeah, he never, he didn't say it to me. He let me, he, he just guided me to the revolu, like the revelation myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. he was just like, you know, and, and he, I think that's kind of like his style. He's, he's not a, uh, cut and dry. Well, he's not a, like, like, he, he doesn't come down uh-huh. on, on people. He's, he's very like, he's a teacher. He, yeah, he's a teacher. He's very, I don't want to, I don't want to say hands off, but he's like more like, you know how to, be the best writer you can be. Right. He's like, I can see you, the direction you need to go. I don't know exactly what you need to do, but I can see the direction you need to go. And I can kind of point you that direction, right, right, you know? Right. And he just let me kind of come to that conclusion right. myself. And then he goes, yes, that's what I'm thinking too. Okay. You know? And then so we he didn't it. tell you, he, it, that's cool. He didn't tell you cut this chapter out. Yeah. He just kind of left it hanging do we are we done? I mean, I was kind of on the fence about. I knew something was off about it too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and like I said, my girlfriend who was helping me edit, she knew something was off about it too. Okay. But she's like, "There's such good imagery left in here. Um, you know, there's such like I don't want to get rid of it, so we didn't. And then we ended up doing it anyway after you know basically two weeks of like sitting on it and thinking about it and you know kind of going back and forth between me and her and then me and Skip. It was probably right. like two weeks time right. of like what to do at the end of this book. Um, the only good thing is all the good imagery from it. I yeah. just pulled and put it in the chapter before it. Like all the my best lines that I thought were in that it last. Still work. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Okay. Still, I was just like, well, is there anywhere to insert what I was trying to say in the thing before? Yeah. So I just kind of pulled out golden all, lines. Yeah, all, all the all the good like po- poetic lines. I yeah, just yeah. Kind of put them in the chapter Let's before. Put in Fort Knox. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, um, how does this book? arrive at John Skip's doorstep? I honestly, okay, so I, I, I went to Bizarro Con in 2014. Okay. Uh, that was my first time there. Uh, I didn't really have that much interaction with Skip. I mean, he, he was there. I, I talked to him a little bit. Um, I was, I, I did um, the ultimate Bizarro showdown, which is uh, like the centerpiece uh, event of the whole weekend. Right. right? And it's a, uh, it's basically like a, you get like, six minutes to do this performance art piece and the, the weirdest one wins essentially. Yeah. Uh, I ended up getting third that year in, in 2014, but he was one of the judges and my girlfriend afterwards was just like, dude, John Skip was like dying. <laughs> he like, he, cause I, I did this like kind of like 
deconstruction of like puns thing was my uh-huh. was my bit. And she's like, he was like falling over laughing. And I was like, oh, oh he, I guess he likes me, you know, right. that's, that's great, you know, or at least he knows my name now, you know. Sure. So um, he came up to Portland. Um, you know, I lived in New Jersey. I live in Portland now, but I lived in New Jersey at this time. He came up to to Portland. Um, I, I think it was for um, some book release or something. I don't know. To to and um, sh- uh, my girlfriend. She I don't think she was my girlfriend yet. Okay, but we were just friends. But she went to this event and he was there too. And she was talking to him. I had just finished the book, so she was like, kind of facilitated the entire thing okay like she knew i was done i didn't know what exactly to, to do with it right she's like well this guy we know has fungasm press and we knew he was looking for books okay you know um just from facebook posts and stuff you right know? and he, he was trying to launch re- or relaunch the line and i just happened to finish it and she and, you know and i'm just like she's like you know he liked you and stuff he thought you were funny maybe you like you know, I could slide that over to him or just mention it. Yeah, yeah. And she did. And he was like, yeah, I'll take a look at it. Nice. And, uh, you know, a couple, I mean, it took him like a month or two to like, uh, actually get to reading it. Uh-huh. And then he read it and he was just like, yeah, I'll put this out. I'd like that. That's yeah. Very cool. That was a great day. You know, uh, uh, between you and I personally, uh, like I said, at the beginning of this interview, we have, we're at, right now have the opportunity to sit down face to face. Yeah. And, the last time we sat down face to face was at a event called CrawlCon, mm-hmm. and uh, at that event, I think that was the day you found out yeah, that found- you were accepted to. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I did. It was it was in the middle of CrawlCon. Yeah, I felt like an asshole too because he started messaging me on, and I'm on my phone, and I was so excited that I was like, for like two hours, I wasn't paying attention to like anything that was going on around <laughs> me. I was just sitting there like. You know, talking to this guy, he's like, "Yeah, I want to put it out. I'm thinking this and this and this," and he's throwing all his ideas at me. Uh-huh. And I'm like, "Oh shit, man!" Like, you know, I'm walking around with like uh, Bill Presti and stuff, right. and I'm like, I must think I'm the biggest asshole in the world because I will not get off my fucking phone. <laughs> but yeah, I was I was really excited. I, I started, yeah, that I was, was a very everybody. cool. Yeah, it was a cool moment. You, you shared that with me, and I was like, "Oh man, I'm so happy for you." Obviously, anytime anybody gets yeah accepted, but when you said you were going to be working with John Skip, it was like, man. That's that's it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, so it, it adds like a, a nice like a little bit of I legitimacy. Mean, he's, he's, to, a, he's a legend. Yeah. I guess now he's a mentor. He did come out with a book in November, but it was uh, a short story. There was a bunch of short stories uh-huh. and, and essays. Uh huh. Is that the uh, the art of horrible people? It was called. Oh, uh, like I said, I, I had the opportunity to read your book. Obviously, I wanted to get to that first, but I I really like. What I'm seeing over at Fungasm, I think, you know, that that's a sort of bizarro I'm into. And uh, there's the, like, uh, I am Genghis Khan. I, you know, it's been around forever. Yeah. It's it's something I I want to get to, and I just never did. Dude, you, you, uh, I remember the, totally. when I read that book, I was blown away. Yeah. I am Genghis Khan. I was just like, what the fuck is this? Like, it was just like, I mean, it's a lot of like, these really weird, it's short stories, it's these really weird ideas, and like the way Violet writes is this like, kind of, it's like kind of angry, but like this beautiful like poetry at the same time, like, she's just like super talented, you know, and uh-huh. I was just like, I, I don't know, it was, it was probably like one of the, I, I when did that book come out, maybe 2011 or 12, yeah, it was yeah, like it's, probably it's my been a while. Year. Um, and, and, and speaking of Violet and then the other authors you mentioned that are on Fungasm, you're actually like one of the few males. Yeah. He's he's very heavy on the female. And I've noticed really recently in Bizarro, there's a lot of females coming into prominence in the genre. Right. And I've had the opportunity to read, uh, who, was, who was, uh, what was that baby, uh, fucking. The baby hater? The baby hater. Yeah. Was that, was that C.V. Hunt? Yeah. I mean, that was a fucking great story. Yeah, yeah, that was great. And that's, you know, I'm not trying to say, well, no, fuck, because women can't fucking write. What the fuck? But, I mean, to, to see him coming out into prominence in, in such, like, this quick, short span of time, yeah. it's, it's almost like they're being discovered or, or they're getting noticed. Do you have any explanation for it? Uh, I, I mean, 
I think it's just as the genre expands, you know, I mean, these are people who out there who have, I mean, this is just the way, you know, if I'm considered a bizarre writer, it's just because this is the way I write. And as you know, this umbrella unfurled this bizarro umbrella sure. underneath it, just right. because this is what I write. Right. And I think as that gets bigger, you know, there's more writers out there who, who are just doing this thing, you know, and they're going to, I mean, a lot of them are going to be women, you know? So, well, sure. Uh, you know what? Maybe it is. It strikes me is, is when you think of bizarre, you think of something more male oriented, you know? Well, I think because a lot of the, uh, Especially the, the the first perception is like it's very like dick joke heavy or something or, or very like yeah but I mean it's not that the the genre isn't no I no, mean the, it it could incorporate the more that. reputable <laughs> the sort of outlets are the, not that well I mean the the thing is like it can incorporate whatever it needs to incorporate you right know, we were talking about this earlier before we started re- recording yeah but, but, but bizarro is a genre is basically you know you just kind of write what you write and it just is weird you know right. like so you're a horror writer but you write weird horror yes it's bizarro you know you're yeah. a science fiction writer it's weird you're, you're a bizarro writer you right. write you write more uh you know comedy oriented stuff but it's really weird uh-huh. and you're probably a bizarro writer right you right. know so i well, i agree and i'm i i'm impressed with with what i'm seeing coming from the women i, I think uh you know, it sort of struck me, I guess, because they're they're all sort of coming at once, yeah. and, and uh, like I said, it, it's sort of the type of genre you wouldn't expect, but well, it, it probably does. Like you said, as the ideas of what it is expands, it it actually. Is. And you know, the other thing is, I mean, if 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 you set somebody up on the pedestal of, of it's it's Rhodes O'Keefe, yeah, and the, basically the matriarch of the, the, the entire, yeah, thing. yeah, more so, you know. Than even Carlton Malick, I would say, and uh, it, but it in the earlier days it wasn't it was still male heavy, yeah. so, and now it seems like the, the females are coming out. I don't know if that's a a maturing or or a, a, a more openness, probably both. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's great, you know. Like the more voices doing this, you know, the the more places it's going to go. Like as I'm saying, that umbrella or whatever, the as it expands, yeah, the more people doing it. You know, the more different um, perspectives getting in there, it's only going to make the entire thing stronger, yeah. the entire genre stronger. And, and more and credibility, gonna, too. Yeah, and it's going to make everybody look good. I, You know, I always say this about Bizarro, too. Um, all it takes is, like, one of these writers in the genre to, like, really break through. Yeah. And it's just going to, like, open the door. Yeah. For everybody, you know? Well, for me, I mean, what drew me to it is is... It's so different, and it's so inventive and creative, and you're, it, it's just, you're not going to read anything yeah. like this, you know? And it's sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow, and uh, you have to give it a chance or find your right mm-hmm. speed of it mm-hmm. because there's different degrees. But, I mean, I think, like you said, if, if something hits and becomes, quote-unquote, like a mainstream bizarro, you already had Carl the Mel come out on uh, – or was it Random House published him? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, it was uh, an imprint of Random House. I think it was right. called Hydra or something like that. Yeah, but, but uh, I mean, that was still basically Random House. a pretty yeah. prominent thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it didn't break up and huge, but that's uh, that's a, definitely that's a vanguard. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's 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 what I see going on with the genre now is is that there's a there's been an expansion taking place. You know, I wasn't at the ground level. I, I kind of got on board when Brian Keane jumped over to Deadite. Yeah. And it, I mean, I wasn't at the ground level either, uh, yeah. you know? I mean, I, I, I was kind of discovering it in like the late 08 or 09, you know, like the late 20 yeah. aughts or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's kind of when it was like starting to get a little bit bigger, a you lot know? More traction, yeah. Well, that's kind of when Amazon was. Yeah, the yeah, whole people were buying. Yeah, were, yeah. Were people were buying through Amazon. I, you know, I remember for a very long time, I was like, I'm "Not putting my credit card on the internet." <laughs> you know, like are these people out of their fucking minds? I'm not going to put this in Amazon. Yeah. I'll just go to the bookstore and buy it. Yeah. But I kept seeing these weird books when I would, you know, because I would browse from my computer and then yeah. go to the store and buy something. Yeah, you know, when I figured out what I wanted, I kept yeah, seeing these weird books, like Carlton Mellick books and, and Kevin Donahue and stuff, and. I would go to the bookstore to find them and I, they weren't there. Yeah. You know? And I was just like, 
So it's like, oh, well, it's just because my bookstore is not big enough. So, like, let me drive up to the bigger one that's, like, 30 miles away. Uh-huh. And I'd go there, and they weren't still there. And I was it. like, well, what the fuck? I guess yeah, I got to go into the city and, and find it. So I go into the bookstore there, and it still wasn't there. And I was just like, eventually I was just like, I need to know what these fucking books are. Yeah. I was like, what the hell is the baby Jesus butt plug? I need to know what this is. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> I, uh. I stumbled on it because, uh, like I said, when Keen went to Deadite and I started seeing those, those Deadite titles and I seen, uh, baby's first book of seriously fucked up shit. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. How can I not read a book titled that, right? <laughs> so I picked that up thinking it's going to be like a horror book, but I'm reading about like fetus beauty contest and I'm like, and I read it and I liked it, but I was like, what, what the fuck was that? Like I just got violated <laughs> and I had no idea, yeah. but I kind of liked it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that's when I started, like, what the hell was going on there? And, it, you know, I come to find out, what was this thing called Bizarro? And there's a lot more like that yeah. out there. And, well, there's definitely that revel revelatory moment when you, like, when I first read my first Bizarro books, I was like, oh. Yeah. Like, this is what I was look. this is what I was going to bookstores for the past, like, three years. Oh, yeah. Up, trying to find. Yeah. Like, just picking up random books, random titles, anything that looked different. Yeah, it's got to you know? be offbeat. Yeah, and, but... You know, and, and things, it, you know, it's almost saying Barnes and Noble is just like this, like all homologous, like just garbage, but you're not, it's going to be hard pressed, at least at this point. It's becoming maybe less of an impossibility yeah. as time goes on, but yeah. especially back in like 09 or something, yeah. you weren't going to find it. Like if Barnes and Noble like was still a bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> if it's still, it still would be. Instead a, of a LP record shop. Yeah, I, I, I buy all my pots and pans at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> Yeah, so, I, I mean, like you said, every little bit, you know, even if there isn't that breakout from now, like a more mainstream thing, but every little step forward is probably better. And I think more so than than any kind of a subgenre that's out there. Yeah. I think Bizarro is the one that's that will climb out of the ashes, out of obscurity, and it will become at least something a lot more mainstream one day. It might find itself on the shelves. Yeah, that would be great, man. It would be great. If there were still uh, bookstores If there around. were still bookstores. <laughs> everything. <laughs> Amazon's going to own everything. I mean, that's a whole other discussion. I, I will say this, though. I've, I've really gotten into paper books. Yeah. Again, there was like a, a period of time where I was only reading on my Kindle for like maybe two or three years. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is great. I don't got to carry books anymore. Yeah. And... I forgot why. I, maybe it was at a convention or something. I bought a couple paper books. I realized I read them like three times as fast when I'm actually holding a book in my hands. You know, there's something to that. So and then I was like, oh, what the fuck, man? I could read so much more. I could get more of this into my head if I yeah. just, you know, spent a little bit more money and, and physically owned all these you copies know, of everything. For me, it is. I, th I think it's because it's, it's in your hand physically. You can tell where you are in a book. Yeah. With an ebook, I mean, you have that obscure page number down at the bottom, but, you know, if it's that, that, pages, little, that little I might have to swipe three times for <laughs> that page to turn. I mean, it's a very concrete thing. You can feel when you're, by the thickness of how many pages you got left, and, and uh, I think if you know where you are, your motivation to, to keep turning that page is a little bit better. It might lend to it. I did notice, too, like, when you hit that midpoint of a book, especially a long one, yeah. that second half just flies by. It does. You know, it's like it's, you're slowly going up that mountain, you know? <laughs> you're dragging your toboggan behind you, and then you hit the middle of a book, and then it's just, like, cruising down to the end. And then when you get down to the last, like, 50, 30, 40 pages, whatever, uh -huh. you're just like, well, I'm just going to sit here and read this whole fucking thing, then. You know, I'm just going to finish this thing. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, 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 it always has its merits, those, those, those uh, paper books, but... As I, I look around my cluttered basement. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you just moved, so I just you, moved. you realize paper books, like there, I, there is a downside to there having is a lots downside. of I will guarantee you in this, this uh, scene from Borders, <laughs> I'll give about 25% of these boxes contain books. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. so there is that problem, which which is why I really loved ebooks when they showed up on the scene. So that's about all we've got time for tonight. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming to sit down with me face to face to join me for this inaugural episode of Bizong. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me be part of 
Bizon. Bizon. Yes, it's. I'm gonna try and sell it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Let's say you have market it, man. You just gotta keep saying. It. Yeah, yeah. Bizon. Bizon. Bizonger. We can short. <laughs> it sounds kind of dirty. We but... can sound. Yeah, we can have fun with it. <laughs> I don't know where it comes from. I have no explanation for it. But I'm. I'm just. I'm just grabbing it by the nuts and and yeah. fucking whipping it. Ride it. It's bizon. <laughs> so that's what it is, and that's all we have time for. The best of luck to you in your career. I see nothing but great things. You you just you, you keep rising from Love Me when I first read you on up. You keep improving. You keep getting better. You keep blowing me away. And uh, I hope this book does great things for you. And I hope you have continued and greater success beyond this book. That is so kind. Thank you very much, Frank. You're welcome, and thank you for writing. The, uh, so there he was, Mr. Danger Slayer, the one and only here you. on Go the immortal episode Get of the right Song Podcast. Now we're going to keep doing this every week for you folks until we just run out of people to talk to. And the genre is so vibrant, I don't see that happening for quite a long time. So please join us next week on our next episode of Bizong, the Bizarre and Weird Fiction Podcast. We have our special guest, Mr. Kevin Strange. See you next week, Zongers, right here exclusively on Project iRadio.